today, Dobrodnia i Privit, I vitaye vas, I warmly welcome you to today's discussion on Ukraine's constitutional crisis. Um, my name is Matija Nellis and I'm a program director at the Center for Liberal Modernity, a Berlin-based think tank and debate platform. Very briefly on the housekeeping, uh, today's discussion is very concise. We will try to be at around 60 minutes. Um, it's a Zoom meeting, so that means everyone has video and speaking rights. So I already hear some echoes, so use your powers carefully. Um, mute yourself while you aren't speaking and feel free to post questions in the chat during the first half of the debate when I will interact with the experts. And then you can raise your physical or virtual hand and we will give you the floor to pose your questions. Dobre. Today's discussion is um, partial or uh, largely in English, but partially also in Ukrainian. So for those who do not understand both languages, I encourage you to activate the translation now. Um, Pan Roman will speak in um, Ukrainian. Ukrainian and yeah. other experts agreed to speak in English. Um, so please activate uh, Ukrainian translation or English translation, which is disguised as Korean. So sadly, it's still Korean, Ukrainian, and then we are good to, st good to start. Right, so I mean, um, Obviously, these are troublesome times, and the only good news coming out of um, uh, uh, Ukraine and the world these days is that uh, Vitali Markiv, um, who many of you know, was wrongfully detained in, Ukraine, uh, in, in Italy, was uh, released yesterday, acquitted by, in Milano. So this is very good news. This is one of the very few positive and shining stories in the past 24 hours, but otherwise we're watching um, uh, elections in Moldova, Georgia, and of course the US. And this is why I also seem very tired. I've been watching and following the US elections very, very closely until too late in the night. And while Ukraine featured in the US election, we will not talk about US elections today at all. Today will be on the constitutional court. And obviously you all know what happened, but just to briefly frame it, uh, last week the constitutional court basically permanently canceled the e-declaration scheme. And Dasha and the others will explain what this means. But this e-declaration scheme was a pillar of the post-Maidan anti-corruption architecture, which obliged, very simply put, state officials, politicians, and judges to declare assets and income of themselves and their immediate relatives. So the government uh, basically ordered its agency to disobey the constitutional court ruling. And here we are in the constitutional crisis, it's one of the few times when the government openly defies the constitutional court ruling. And we'll come to that in a second and what it means. But last week, we already saw protests in Ukraine and in parliament um, and in civil society, there's discussion and the options range, which we also discussed today from minor changes, um, asking the judges to resign, to um, changing the setup of the constitutional court to an outright dissolution of the court. So to help us understand where we stand in this crisis, um, what options are on the table, and what role the US, if at all, Germany and the EU can have in this process, we've brought together a stellar lineup of experts. So um, briefly, um, uh, introduction, or let me briefly introduce these four speakers. We have um, Dasha Kalenyuk, or Daria Kalenyuk, CEO of the Anti-Corruption Action Center, CPK in Ukrainian. Um, who's one of the most uh, well-known anti-corruption NGOs in Ukraine. We have Ira Shiba, um, Irina Shiba, CEO of the De Jure um, Foundation and just selected in the Forbes 30 under 30. So congratulations on that, Vitaya, Vitaya. And we have, and also from Ukraine, um, Roman Kravets, a prominent journalist uh, from the Ukrainska Pravda, which is, as, as you know, one of um, Ukraine's main independent um, news outlets, um, online media. And last but not least, we have David Stulik. And for those, I mean, this is audiences I see largely German uh, uh, mixed actually in Ukraine. For Ukrainians, David doesn't need an introduction. He was in uh, spokesperson of the EU delegation to Ukraine for 12 years, he, he told me. So he's an institution uh, himself, but he has left Ukraine and is now head of the Eastern European program at the European Values Center for Security Policy in Prague. Now, long introduction, but let me begin with you, Dasha. So be before we come to the legal or non-legal ways out of the crisis, please 
help us make sense of the crisis because sadly as we we're discussing before the the audience joined this crisis didn't get too much attention in german media so help us understand why this ruling was so scandalous and what impact it it has and had on ukraine and why this situation is dangerous because to be honest uh, if, if you're cynical you saw ukraine live with several scandalous court decisions of the constitutional court so help us understand why the situation is especially grave thank you so that, that thank you uh, thank you matthias uh, thank you everyone for your interest um i will try uh, just to explain the big picture what is happening right now it is not only about the anti-corruption we for what constitutional court is doing now is simply keeping hostages in the form of anti-corruption reform land reform banking reform language law and trying to undermine ukrainian cooperation with the west who is doing that these are judges who are not independent obviously the constitutional court judges compose of people who have very shady reputation some of these people were appointed by president yanukovych back in 2013 and these people are now colluding with the interests of viktor medvedchuk and igor kolonoisky viktor medvedchuk is the leader of pro-russian opposition in ukraine he's an ally of putin he publicly advocates ukraine to getting closely to russia and cooperating with kremlin he owns huge media propaganda in ukraine and he increased his he increased his influence and uh, media presence within the last two years dramatically so he literally is spreading fakes every day so basically what constitutional court did last week it violated the constitution the decision which court took is far more extended to what actually MPs asked the court to explain. Constitutional court didn't have arguments and didn't explain itself why it decided that certain articles of the corruption prevention law are unconstitutional. Constitutional court judges were acting in the conflict of interest, which is forbidden actually by the Ukrainian constitution as well. So at least three judges of the constitutional court were already under the procedure of their assets verification and National Anti-Corruption Preventive Commission was analyzing their asset declarations. The head of the constitutional court, his name is Tupitsky, Alexander Tupitsky, he didn't declare that he has land in Crimea. He didn't declare that he sold that land. Probably he was trying to hide that he sold it in violation of Ukrainian law, which prohibits sale of land in Crimea according to Russian legislation. And when the head of the Constitutional Court of Ukraine, the most important judicial institution, is hiding his assets in Crimea and making deals according to Russian legislation, he definitely is not acting independently and he cannot be trusted. So what that constitutional court decision made? It actually blocked possibility to have access to pub, to have public access to asset declarations of all public servants in Ukraine. And it was the key achievement of Ukraine after the revolution of dignity. Ukraine created the comprehensive system of electronic asset declarations of public officials. For Germany, it's even probably unusual thing, but in Ukraine, this is a powerful, important tool for civil society, for journalists, for citizens of Ukraine to control public officials, to see what are their assets and prevent theft and make it much more higher risks for public officials to steal. Finally, a year ago, 
Ukrainian Independent Agency, National Anti-Corruption Preventive Commission, got a good leader who started to verify these asset declarations. And this is also the powers which Ukrainian parliament gave after the revolution of dignity to this agency. And these powers are undermined now by constitutional court. So, no access to public declarations, to public system of electronic declarations, no ability to verify these asset declarations, no responsibility for false statements. Criminal liability was upheld by the Constitutional Court. And in addition to that, a few more even uh, damages which were even not hard to be predicted. We are getting them as, as we analyze in this, this decision. So basically the results of the local elections uh, can be even in danger because of that law. So, and what is more important and finally um, is why it is a danger to Ukraine. Because these all anti-corruption tools were part of the Ukraine EU and the Ukraine IMF agreements of cooperation. Electronic system of asset declaration and their verification mo uh, model was part of the EU-Ukraine visa liberalization action plan. So we have received free visa regime in Europe because we created these tools. Electronic system of asset declaration and ability to criminal to, to an ability to hold responsible with criminal liability people who commit fraud in asset declarations with intention. This was also part of the commitment between Ukraine and the IMF, International Monetary Fund. So, and but this is not the end of the story. It is not only about anti-corruption reform. Today, one of the judges of the Constitutional Court went public and published draft decision of the land reform and appealed to the people of Ukraine. It is an unprecedented situation when the Constitutional Court judge is publishing draft decision and appealing to the people of Ukraine. It's extending actually to what powers they have. And that draft decision is actually canceling entirely the land reform law. So it says that land in Ukraine cannot be sold and cannot be owned by foreign citizens, by companies owned by foreign citizens and companies which are registered abroad. This directly contradicts what Ukraine committed to do under the Ukraine memorandum with IMF. So it is the second pillar of Ukraine cooperation with the West, specifically with the IMF. If I recall well, it is also, the land reform was also on the top of the agenda of the European Union. So they cut, well, the land reform, it, it is just draft decision, draft decision. They didn't vote for that yet, but they went public constitutional court judges and appealed to Ukrainian people saying, listen guys, you have to do the referendum. Ukrainians have to do the referendum to decide whether we can sell our land. And this is very, very dangerous. So therefore, it is the existential threat to Ukraine. The Constitutional Court of Ukraine is occupied by judges who are not serving in the interest of Ukrainian people. Therefore, they have to be stopped immediately. And therefore, we are appealing to Ukrainian parliament to block them, to, to, to adopt legislation which will block them. There are now two possible scenarios how to do that, two possible ways. One, one is unconstitutional, other is more constitutional, I would say. One is initiated by president, and I'm thankful to President Zelensky that he immediately reacted to the existential threat and that he initiated the legislation which allows rebooting the constitutional court and hiring new judges and which restores the anti-corruption reform. However, it's not getting support of people in the parliament. There is one more solution which is now being introduced. Specifically, Golos party is supporting and pushing for this solution. 
it could be a temporary solution. The idea is to block the constitutional court with increasing the quorum. So basically the amount of judges which have to vote to make certain decision. And now what we are doing, we are trying to, to convince parliament to respond to the existential threat to Ukraine and to block the constitutional court. They are acting as legal terrorists who are keeping hostages inside and killing them one by one. They killed anti-corruption reform. The next one is land reform and afterwards will be banking reform. Thank you, Dasha. Very um, insightful. Ira, do you first of all share this assessment? Uh, um, and again, our Western instincts are to side with institutions and Dasha outlined very much that uh, the, the court poses an existential threat, not just to um, Western integration, but really to, to many of re uh, the reform gains that Ukraine made, not just for being friends with EU, but really for, for itself, right? So uh, do you share this um, drastic outlook and please share your insights on um, the ways out? Because just like at CPK, the Euro also formulated several ways out and Dasha outlined two of them. So how do you view that and uh, what's the way forward? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Matija, first of all, for organizing this discussion. I think it's really timely that, uh, and we need all our partners to actually know what's happening on. We were just discussing that the timing was selected not, um, like, was selected specifically when all the societies looking up to US and checking on the American elections and so many other things happening that nobody really looking into what is happening into Ukraine right now. But, and I wanna really back up Dasha on that, that it's not just a threat for anti-corruption reform. This dependent uh, constitutional court is uh, posing a threat to all democratic progressive reforms that we implemented since 2014. It's, they already, Dasha already mentioned about land reform, it's also the language reform, it's illustration of the Anvorsi officials who worked with, with Yanukovych and many other. And, but first, before talking about solutions, I want to just uh, pay attention or explain why it happened why it was so like possible for the constitutional court to make such a unsubstantiated decision that they actually didn't even try to explain why they do it in a way. They just said, this is a threat to our independency. This is why we kind of canceling the electronic declaration and the corruption reform for, for the procedure of appointment of the Constitutional Court judges was politicized. Uh, to become a judge of the Constitutional Court, you would need to have a good ties in the office of the president or in the parliament. Even though now the Constitution foresees that should be an open competition, as competition is never be made. And what we see now that we have 15 judges sitting in the Constitutional Court with uh, three open seats, and only four of them voted against this decision. And those were the, the, the people who came up from the academia. All the others, they are the old judges who used to serve to, to their vassals, to, to serve to the people who helped them to gain the position of the judge and then to gain the position of the constitutional court judge. And in the past 10 years or 15 years, we saw many decisions favoring President Kuchma, President Yanukovych, and this last decision is favoring uh, Vladimir Putin. It's favoring the uh, Russian Federation because it says that like constitutional court doesn't want Ukraine to be um, working with the EU uh, because it violates and cancels all the obligations that we, uh, we took on ourselves, that we promised to become a, a member of European community. And this is not what the, most of the people want well, people of my NGO, people of Dario NGO, uh, hundreds of people who came up to the Constitutional Court to protest about that. And it's not about just about non-visa regime of which travels to Berlin, but it's also, uh, it's also about our European course, about the decision that we made in 2014 to move far from Russia and closer to, to EU. Uh, some of the judges who made a dissenting opinion, they said about that in, in the text of their opinion, that this law was not substantiated, that it's against our obligation, that it's against of all of our intention, intentions to fight corruption, and it shouldn't, be, uh, shouldn't have been adopted in the way. 
And, and now we are in a constitutional crisis uh, because we realize that according to our constitution, there is no possibility to cancel or to appeal this decision. And uh, we, but it's, but it's not only about the cancelling decision. There are a few issues that should be, uh, should, that we should be looking into. The first is how to restore the anti-corruption infrastructure that the constitutional court destroyed, but also to ensure and protect the, that the other reforms and important laws that might be now blocked or uh, or neglected by the decisions of the next decision of the constitutional court. And last but not least, to ensure the integrity of the constitutional court itself. Uh, as an analytical center, we usually propose one solution. Yeah, we, we, we look into different ways that are there and we look for the one that is optimal. And unfortunately, in this case, there is no ideal decision because for the, the, the most, the least painful for, for Ukraine decision would be if the judges would resign or come up themselves with the decisions or have to overlook it because there was a conflict of interest so they could look into this law again. But now we realize from the statements of the head of this court that they still don't understand what they've done and they still are not afraid of the consequences. They are just saying that we don't see anything unconstitutional there. Or, or the, the people are planning the protests near the houses of the, um, of the head of the court and he says, no, no you, you shouldn't go there because this is my mother-in-law lives there and she's not, not at home, she's in Donbass, which is not under control of, of Ukraine, it's under control now of, the, uh, of our enemies. Um, but the so we understand that it might be like a harder solutions and some of them really like political and and radical to to look into these issues now we already uh, have seven or eight or maybe even law, like more laws or so draft laws submitted by the different members of the parliament but also the president Zelensky to uh, to the parliament to solve these issues um, what are the, the ways that are discussed? So the first reaction of the president was the termination of the current composition of the constitutional court by the simple law. Um, obviously, this termination would help to stop the, uh, the actually attack on other reforms and to, would help to get rid of the bad judges in the constitutional court. But we all understand that this is like a dangerous precedent, that decision can open the way of other unconstitutional attempts at uh, relaunching other institutions for decisions that are not popular or not fit in the government's agenda. And we also think that the new constitutional court might not uh, actually want to act on this decision. They will try to just also not pay attention on it. Yeah, but also that some credible judges might not apply for, for the new things. But the key problem in the, presidency, uh, the President Zelensky law is that he said that after the constitutional judges are terminated, uh, the new judges should be appointed. But the problem that they will be appointed with the same procedure that we had for last 25 years, for 20, 26, 27, that, um, that still politicized and still will open the door to appoint the, the judges who are making decisions in favor, not of the constitution, not of the people, but in favor of the politicians who help them to, uh, to take those seats. Uh, so in other laws that are discussing the, 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 they're not being discussed is the laws that, that are more constitutional and they are about blocking the possibility of this unworthy composition to make any other decisions. Uh, there are two ways to do that. One, to increase the quorum for making decisions and, and another to increase the number of judges that should uh, vote for certain decisions. Now uh, the, the court is under seated, so there are still three open uh, positions that should be filled in by the parliament and by the uh, Congress of Judges. The problem here again, that they will be, if, if the competition will start now, they will still be done under the, uh, this old procedure with no competition, with no integrity checks, which will not lead us to a better composition of the anti-corruption, of the constitutional court. So some other ideas that is also the change of the composition of the constitutional court by the constitutional amend amendments. Of course, this way would be the most constitutional and legal, but we all now understand that we will not be able to get 300 votes 
good version of the amendments. And moreover, the constitutional amendments will require the approval of the sitting constitutional court judges. That it is, this is uh, absolutely unlikely that they will support it. And so there are some other laws in the parliament that are looking into uh, how to restore the anti-corruption laws. Uh, specifically, the Rosumko submitted one last just uh, yesterday. And but the problem with his draft is that it's just technically incorrect, and it will not help to to restore the initiative. So um, they they would need to work on that anymore. So from our opinion, the, the, just to wrap it up, to sum up, there is no perfect solution to make it really quickly. And it's going to be a political responsibility of the parliament to find a way that would help in a most legal way to stop the constitutional court for, from cancelling uh, other successful reforms. And they should do it as quickly as possible. And more legal way to do it is through increasing the quorum or increasing the number of votes. But in any case, they should be also in parallel working on changes of procedure, how the, uh, how the judges should be selected. And my colleagues from Antak also in detail described how it could be done. And Daria and I, we can share our ideas because we had this successful story of anti-corruption court created that is still working. Uh, good and is also under threat now of the constitutional court and it's one of the there is a motion submitted to the constitutional court on the uh, constitutionality of the of the hack uh, so we also need to protect this institution and this institution was formed with the participation of international experts who provided an integrity check of each candidate and then there was an uh, inner body that appointed them formally. So this is uh, the mechanism that we can use here as well. So we form a trustworthy commission that screens all the candidates and then the subjects of appointment uh, select among the best ones. So this is the thing. But also we need to think about the, a lot about the restoration of the anti-corruption norms and, and, and to prevent this scenario in the future. And last but not least, this is something that's been overlooked, but the Constitutional Court is not the only institution in Ukraine that is rolling back the reforms. We also have this District Administrative Court in Kiev. We have High Council of Justice that appointing we'll judges. Come, we'll come to that in a second. Sorry? No, we'll come to the other problematic institutions yeah. in a second. Let so me, the, let me. Just one of the things that the just the head of the district court said less recently that he is controlling the constitutional court. So we really need to understand that this is like a complex problem that requires a complex solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, again, also very insightful and very important. Um, also for emphasizing, thank you, um, the kind of it's a basically a hydra, right? If you if you cut off the even if you dissolve the constitutional court, which would be the most radical solution, it's just one of the hydra's heads. So thank you for emphasizing that there are other um, problems which would have to be addressed. And um, without going into the details at this point, um, these are important. So the selection and vetting of the judges is key. Whether you dissolve the court or not, whether you fill it with, with other judges or not, it's uh, uh, key. Now, Pan Roman, uh, to, over to you. We already heard some of the legislative solutions, and I want to uh, get your assessment on the political side. So both yep. uh, Dasha and Ira said that there are different laws, dissolution, and Golos' suggestion to change to the quorum, the quorum or the number of judges on the court. How do you view this political side of the story? Which of these solutions mm -hmm. is gaining support? Which of the solutions do you think is possible? And how do you view this as a political journalist, as a journalist, um, the constitutional crisis? How do you view that? I'll uh, try to speak on, on Ukrainian language, as, as uh, is my exactly. asking for you. Um, no, no, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, this problem has revealed uh, a huge problem. Sorry for repeating the uh, problem, or word the problem two times. Um, ми не могли навіть такого собі уявити, що ну, парламент не може нічого взагалі зробити, коли президент вносить якийсь законопроект, ба більше, парламент навіть не, не виносить на розгляд законопроект президента, коли президент публічно виходить на телеканали і погрожує, що я можу розпустити парламент, якщо парламент не прийме законопроект по розпуску КСУ, так? то ну, це дуже трагічно. Е, мене як політичного журналіста насправді турбує інша сторона цієї медалі, 
Тому що е, президент, е, мене дивує, що президент, ну, для нього це стало такою якоюсь ну, неочікуваністю, що от Конституційний суд прийняв таке рішення. Тому що у президента України є свій представник в Конституційному суді. У президента України є свій е, ну, друг, е, який, друг дитинства, який очолює Службу безпеки України. І мене щиро дивує, що всі знали, ну вибачте, всі знали, що елементарний розгляд цієї справи має відбутися от-от найближчими днями. А президент цього не знав. І якщо він цього не знав, Ну, ладно, це ще я можу якось зрозуміти. Ну, людина, можливо, що в політиці не зовсім розібралася до кінця. А якщо він знав і закрив на це очі, не думаючи про наслідки, то мене це турбує як громадянина. Як я маю далі е, ну, бути в такому становищі, знаючи, що мій президент може закривати очі на такі вкрай важливі речі, як Конституційний суд, який скасовує ряд наших реформ. Серед всього іншого я хочу зазначити, ну, я не знаю, як, як, як має вирішити це питання, так, юридично, правильно, але мене турбує, що ніхто не думає зараз про наслідки, так, ми отримали бомбу і вона зірвалась відразу, так, У нас немає жодного там сапера. Мене також турбує, що, мені здається, що дотепер, Офіс президента до кінця не розглядає цю проблему як надсерйозною. Вони продовжують грати у підкилимну і, і ігри, у підкилимні ігри, хто має бути ближчим до президента, як ми маємо розібратися із поганим результатом місцевих виборів. Сьогодні, наприклад, Андрій Єрмак, якщо ви там не знали, то він конфліктував із першим з своїм заступником Сергієм Трофімовим, який є виходцем з 95-го кварталу і дуже близькою людиною до Зеленського. Так от сьогодні він звільнений із цієї посади. От, він, на нього повісили е, якби всі проблеми на місцевих виборах, і він зараз став радником Зеленського. Ну, і е, коли, до речі, була дуже цікава ситуація, вчора ж парламент мав все-таки розглядати законопроект президента про Конституційний суд, е, ну, його, якщо ви знаєте, не виносили, я вже про це говорив, е, і з самого ранку президент України у своєму твіттері чомусь, у своєму в Телеграмі, на своїх сторінках, взагалі, на своїх офіційних сторінках і в Фейсбуці, і в Телеграмі, я думаю, що в Твіттері так само, але я це побачив просто в Телеграмі. Він відповідав на якісь звинувачення російського режисера, ну, тобто це, в мене таке враження, ладно, президент у нас недосвідчений, але ж медійники, можливо, можуть підказати президентові, що як правильно комунікувати із суспільством. Мене турбує отака річ. І ще, ще важлива річ. Дар'я називала два прізвища, це Коломойський і Медведчук. Ми всі їх якби, називаємо, так? але мене цікавить і інше. А чи будуть наші спецслужби перевіряти, чи Коломойський, чи пан Медведчук, чи люди з, його, з їхнього оточення, так? в той чи інший спосіб якось впливали на суддів? Ну, тому що ми можемо багато що говорити, але ми ж хочемо побачити результат, правильно? Ну, наразі в мене немає таких даних, що хтось веде ну, перевірку щодо цих двох осіб. У мене все. And let me follow up and ask you um, about the solution um, or on the political uh, chances of uh, the um, Zelensky's law. It's, it became clear that Golos, European Solidarity, mm -hmm. Pro-Russian for Life and Kolomorsky's faction oppose it. So Zelensky would have to have a unity within his own party and his, within, his, within his faction. So on the political majority side, uh, is Zelensky, how's, how do you assess this? or on Golos's suggestion when looking at the parliament, which of the two options uh, would gain political majority or possibility? Мені здається, що Володимиру Зеленському, перш за все, треба попрацювати зі своєю фракцією. В нього є своя монобільшість. Він, не може, він може навіть не озиратися на інші фракції. Він може не дивитися, що там думає голос. Він може не дивитися, що думає європейська солідарність. У нього є 250 голосів, 248, якщо бути точно. Він має просто елементарно почати працювати зі своїми депутатами. Нам депутати скаржаться, що ви частіше спілкуєтесь з президентом і з керівництвом офісу, аніж ми. Мені здається, ну, це, це якісь дуже прості речі політ, політичні. Ти маєш контролювати просто, що в тебе відбувається під носом у твоїй же команді, а ти займаєшся іншим.
Тут навіть не питання тільки до президента. Ну, Андрій Єрмак цим має займатися, він має забезпечувати його комфорт як керівник офісу. Ну, якщо, не Андрій Єрм... якщо Андрій Єрмак цим не хоче займатися, ну, призначте людину, яка в офісі президента буде координувати роботу депутатів. Ну, от такі речі. All right, so last but not least, and then I open up to, to the floor. I already see some uh, hands, virtual hands. Uh, David, let's bring you in um, as our only voice from abroad. I mean, I, I already said you were in Kiev for 12 years. Um, and you've seen many different crises, really, literally, uh, from Yanukovych uh, changing the constitution, from the revolution of dignity and so on. So maybe, first of all, how would you rank this crisis? now that you're abroad but how do you rank this based on your experience and most critically of course we are interested in your assessment of the west and by west at the moment uh, we mean eu and germany the west's role in resolving this crisis and lastly there were signals by um, some institutions like uh, the venice commission which is not part of the eu i should emphasize a venice commission and greco that were critical of the president's solution to dissolve the court so how do you view this signals coming from Europe and uh, how can we help to resolve the crisis, David? Over to you. Right. Uh, thank you, Mattia. Uh, first of all, let me express my personal feelings. I feel really sad and very, really frustrated by the recent war in Ukraine. Uh, that's the first thing, uh, because the situation in Ukraine, for those of us who are the friends of Ukraine, is creating even more uh, difficult challenges uh, to defend Ukraine abroad or vis-a-vis -vis our, let's say, counterparts or political elites. So you are making, I mean, the Ukrainians as such are making our task more difficult than before. Uh, second thing, I've consulted a number of my former colleagues uh, from the EU institutions. Uh, so I asked them about the EU views and uh, about the internal EU, let's say, deliberations of the current situation so I will base my comments on, on those talks that I have had during the last couple of days. Uh, so first thing, uh, as I said, it's, it's a terrible reputational damage for Ukraine. And also those in Ukraine who are involved in these, uh, let's say, conflicts and uh, uh, disputes should be aware that the EU has many more issues on the table right now. Uh, it's not only the US elections, COVID, or the latest terrorist attacks in France or Austria, but also the situation in other Eastern European countries, Eastern partnership countries. The EU has to deal with the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh. The EU has to deal with the situation in Belarus. We have had over the last weekend, the elections uh, in Georgia and in Moldova, which are also quite important uh, for the uh, European aspirations of these two countries. And then finally, the situation in Ukraine gets out of the control in such a way uh, with the ruling of the Constitutional Court on the 27th of October. And from my own experience, I can tell you this is not a coincidence that this decision was just made during uh, these days. So for the EU, this is uh, another kind of a blow in the face, I would say. Uh, it, create, it contributes to that uh, fatigue with Ukraine uh, I, my colleagues who are dealing with Ukraine, they just were saying that uh, indeed this is the most unfortunate development that is happening there. Uh, because Ukraine is, was used, it has been used as a sort of a flagship country, as a role model country for the whole Eastern partnership. Uh, anyway, the EU has a very, I would say informally, a very clear point of view on the current situation. And that point of view is very close to the one of the Venice Commission and uh, of the Greco heads. Uh, so the EU is very much against uh, solving this uh, constitutional crisis in an anti-constitutional way. So that law that was proposed by the president has met with a lot of amusement and uh, disappointment by many EU officials. So this is not the way how you could cure the current situation. Uh, there was a kind of a joint position of a number of Ukrainian NGOs, uh, including uh, the URA Foundation, ERA is the uh, CEO of that, or uh, Amnesty Interna uh, Transparency International. And these proposals are much more closer to the views of the EU officials, 
at least. Uh, so what the EU could do in this situation? I mean, there is a number of EU uh, technical assistance projects, experts that are on there on the ground. There are colleagues at the EU delegation, there are colleagues at the headquarters in Brussels uh, who are lawyers who have been working on the judicial reform and on the anti-corruption uh, reform for a quite long time. So they have a concrete and clear uh, views and proposals how to help the situation. So for example, uh, they also mentioned to me yesterday and day before yesterday that uh, we should take as an example, the selection process of anti-corruption court judges, uh, which were selected in such a way that they're, they're also their moral integrity was checked by the Ukrainian public, by the international observers. So this is the way how, for example, the future selection or appointment of uh, constitutional judges uh, could be held. So this is a thing that uh, the EU can help with. Uh, the second thing uh, that the EU has been doing uh, quite a lot uh, in terms of the fight against corruption was, the, for example, the relaunch of the National Agency for the Preventing of Corruption. Uh, it has been relaunched uh, more or less a year ago with the new head of that uh, agency. And again, it was uh, done, this sort of a relaunch in a kind of a coalition between the Western partners and the active civil society and experts in Ukraine. Uh, because uh, the Ukrainian political elites know perfectly well what needs to be done, but there is no clear political will to move on on a true and genuine uh, judicial reform. And that's the huge problem that the Ukrainian counterparts the people my colleagues uh, on the side of the EU are talking to, they are playing a sort of a game with us, with the donors. And this is a, a kind of a game uh, where uh, the most uh, important resource uh, is the trust and time and uh, patience. So there's a kind of a risky game that indeed uh, the patience and the kind of a, uh, empathy on the side of Western donors may come to the end. Uh, because there are another, other issues that are on, now on the agenda. Uh, one of them is the clarification of the legal status of the NABU that needs to be sorted out by 16th of December, because the Constitutional Court also questioned the, the legal grounds for the appointment of the head of the NABU. And if nothing is done by the 16th of December, the NABU, which is, I would say, a uh, a very loved child or very loved institution by the UN and other Western donors uh, will face uh, huge legal problems in the courts. And it will be another drop of water in that pound of water that uh, could uh, lead to very, very uh, unpleasant consequences. And one of them is this kind of a nuclear button called the visa-free regime. Uh, Frankly speaking, when I hear the statements of also kind of my former friends of friends, like Dmitry Kuleba, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, or Olga Stefanishin, a Vice Prime Minister for European Integration, saying that there is no danger for a visa-free regime, they are absolutely wrong. Yes, there is no immediate threat and danger for a visa-free regime for Ukrainian citizens, but in the midterm and long term, it is coming. It's like saying in the middle of the summer, there will be no snow tomorrow. Yes, there will be no snow, but it will come. Unfortunately, these processes uh, of changing the position of the EU or member states of the European Union have started. This damage has been done, as I said at the very beginning, that there is a reputational damage caused to Ukraine. So these things like uh, visa-free regime uh, suspension, indeed might uh, be soon on the agenda, officially on the agenda of the institutions. The second thing, I would say even more important, and here I would just compliment what Ira and uh, Dasha said, uh, the whole infrastructure for the fight against uh, corruption is uh, are the also conditions for the payment of the IMF and for the EU macrofinancial assistance. So again, if the Ukrainian parliamentarians, politicians don't act according to their own commitments, also this uh, a very important macrofinancial uh, variable is put into a question mark. Again, my colleagues from the EU told me that Ukrainian officials perfectly know what needs to be done, but there are vested interests, there are some other interests that are behind that are preventing them to act smoothly and frankly 
and genuinely on these issues, like the issues of the uh, judicial reform, as well as the fight against corruption. So that's a kind of a very bleak and I would say rather unpleasant uh, reality that we, the friends of Ukraine, uh, outside of Ukraine, abroad are facing. But yeah, it, we are right, doing as much as we can. I see um, next one I will bring in Marie Louise who raised her virtual hand who is also my boss. I just want to say that there are two e, um, positions that I see very uh, different. So Dasha saying, uh, Dasha Kalnyuk saying this is an existential threat and um, if it is then the question is do we have the time to uh, do incremental changes, right? It seems that the EU is, is not sharing this existential threat assessment as of now and is still supporting more incremental changes, the ones that Ira has outlined. So there seems to be a gap, I, and I don't know how to bridge this gap, but Marie-Louise, uh, are, are we, um, do we have you? We can't hear you just yet. You have to unmute yourself. We'll uh, give you a sec. Yeah. Okay, here we are. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much. Um, yes, we are really disturbed, of course, and, uh, there is debates. We just had the Kiev dialogue in Berlin for two days. And of course, this uh, topic was all around. Um, and into this conference, we got the information that the Vienna Commission has taken a very, very clear stand that any proposals Mr. Zelensky has been done until now are unlegal and not a way that would be accepted. I was a little upset about this fast step from the Vienna Commission, I have to admit. And I want to reach out a little bit. Um, I think rather obviously, in former words, you would have said the move of the Constitutional Court is a counter-revolutionary step. What do we have? We had Maidan. Uh, I don't know whether Vienna, con uh, Vienna Commission ever was asked if, if, uh, if replacing uh, Yanukovych was something which was being seen legal. If you come down to the point, 100,000 people on Maidan, or even in some more, in some more cities, how do they have the right to send away a legally elected president? The fact that Yanukovych went, left, had to go, and then there were solutions being uh, taken which were not, the constitution was not prepared for, you all remember it, taking the president of the parliament as a, um, a president uh, for the, the time to overcome. All this was not legal because it was a revolutionary situation. And of course, revolution situations are not sticking to legal grounds. Now the question is what has happened with the uh, decision of this Supreme Court? Uh, if we share the analysis that this was a well set, well organized, rational, anti-revolutionary step to bring back a certain fraction of oligarchs into power, and even more important, to push out those two forces that can help once in a while push Ukraine towards a course which means let's go on, on going west in this general way. Um, then you have to ask yourself, is the mere legal answer the correct one? Or do we have a situation where a legal framework, seemingly legal framework, is being used to put away a legal system and undermine it and bring back 
the old non-democratic forces. And I think that uh, Vienna Commission, of course, they have the task to look at the laws, but there needs to be a second look and this needs to be political. And if you come to the conclusion, it is a counter-revolutionary step. And if you come to the conclusion that it is also meant to push out uh, the IMF and the EU, then you have to look what can be done. Um, and yes, of course, everybody who is stretching the point that any unlegal uh, step now can be misused in a different situation again. This is a, a dilemma which you just can't find a way out of. Um, but then I think the solution would have to be to seek the discussion and support of those very important international uh, um, institutions, which is IMF and EU, to find a, at the moment, fast way out to push back those, uh, uh, those uh, counter-revolutionary decisions. And uh, yes, David is right, of course, you can say uh, they could have been acting for a long time. And you know that we have been asking ourselves for a year, who is Zelensky? What is he, what is he standing for? And the picture ne really need, got, never got that clear, but maybe this is my idea. Now we are in a situation where he has to decide which way he wants to go. And uh, I hope that Mr. Yermak understands also. And if Mr. Yermak is not decided to go the way towards EU or West, then he's not the right man for a president who might have understood now. So I would propose uh, a crisis meeting like we probably would have had if the war would have inflamed again together with those institutions and making transparent, we have this dilemma. We do not have a totally correct legal way out of this dilemma, but the outcome will be all your possibilities of working here will be cut off. So can we find a possibility? It's a little bit like the Steinmeier um, uh, uh, letter, which was not so successful because it was not clear enough uh, and maybe not even much enough in the interest of the uh, Ukrainian of the Maidan, but I think something like that at the moment would be the way to go. Because you can't just stand there, fold your hands and say, too bad, we have not been acting early enough. Like little bit David <laughs> was your uh, uh, message, which is true, but it doesn't help at the moment. All right, um, before I give the floor to Wilfried Jäger, who raised the hand, Sasha, you wanted to respond, please, uh, briefly, and then Wilfried Jäger. Uh, yes, I wanted to respond uh, to, to a few issues. First, uh, uh, Venice Commission and Greco letter was really strange, so quick. Uh, so the question is uh, how they responded, and it's not the official position of the Greco and Venice Commission. And we are now chatting with, with David, and I understand all the concern about the rule of law. I understand that we are actually trapped Ukraine is trapped when we have to adhere to the rule of law, when we have to adhere to the constitution. And this trap was being prepared, strategically prepared by our enemies. We cannot fire constitutional court judges through changes to the constitution, because constitutional court judges have to give their thinking approval for these changes. We cannot recall constitutional court judges. And in such kind of a situation, when their next steps will be killing land reform, banking reform, the threats from them and from these decisions are much, much higher than violating the constitutional norms. And from legal point of view, I'm a lawyer, I have to legal education. 
I want to say that if there will be a proper competition, and I fully agree here with Ira that presidential law lacks this proper competition for the new judges to which there could be trust of civil society and international partners. So the new constitutional court judges could look into this situation with analyzing what is in depth in the constitution. Because there are certain other norms of the constitution which were violated of the, by the constitutional court judges. There is a threat, but the threat of not acting is higher. And the good thing about President Zelensky here, and believe us, we are a harsh critics of President Zelensky, but in this case, he reacted fast. I agree with Roman that his reaction was too slow. He had to do something before. But after the decision, his reaction was fast, it was strong, and he raised, you know, his, his uh, kind of uh, states. He demands parliament to act. This is important. And the parliament has to block the constitutional court. David tells me that there are, half there, there are more legal solutions. There are more legal solutions. And I have explained what is the legal, half legal solution, well, more legal solution. It is blocking the quorum. There is this, the draft law initiated by Golos. What we demand parliament vote it now. Vote it now even if there will be violation of the rules of the procedure for voting. Vote it now. These are terrorists in the constitutional court which are destroying Ukraine. It will be irreversible damage. Irreversible damage if you will not act. But unfortunately, it, it looks that, you know, Politicians in parliament like Razumkov, like Petro Poroshenko, which are declaring good things, they are not thinking about the, the stakes. They are playing politics. Razumkov registered draft law in order to make more problems for President Zelensky. They have big problems in their communication and their relationships. And he registers draft law, which gets support of all other factions, because this draft law doesn't resolve anything. And MPs perfectly know that. It's very easy for them to vote for this draft law, because they can say to their voters, we did something. We voted the law, which doesn't solve anything. And we called the judges of the Constitutional Court to resign. And they will not resign. They, they are actually legal terrorists in the, in the court. And that's, uh, that's the problem. Right. We are nearing the end. So I have to cut you short. I want the others to, uh, to have a closing remark too. So um, very briefly, uh, Wilfried Jirge and Rebecca Harms, and then we stop. So um, in the order, Wilfried, you will first please unmute yourself and pose your question. Try to be precise in your comment or statement, please. Yes, I mean, I, I make it short. This is a very important discussion. Thank you, Daria. It's nice to see you again. Um, I, I would like only to comment what uh, RPR coalition said. I mean, they actually accentuated that the president should not dissolve the uh, constitutional court because that can also have disastrous consequences for Ukraine. And I would like to uh, ask you to think about not only about that anti-corruption uh, attack, which is really an attack on Ukraine. I absolutely agree with that. There's no doubt about who is that and from which side it comes. But please uh, be aware that this chaos it is all, also a fight of different powers in Ukraine, which was incented by Mr. Zelensky and other people than only the pro-Russian uh, blocs. And uh, what we have now is a chaotic situation, an uh, inconsequent division of powers, which will be used further by these powers. And that, will, that problem will be, will be not resolved by a dissolution or a non- a not um, uh, a reflected step uh, concerning the constitutional court. So I absolutely agree with all these threats, yes, and I would support Marie-Louise Beck to now sit together, to, to become quiet and really to think what to do together. The constructive, constructive powers should sit together around the table and coordinate uh, their steps. But please be aware, it is not about only corruption. It is about the institutional problems and the tendency of usurpation of power in Ukraine. Think about DBR, think about general prosecution. 
and all these things that were the preconditions for the situation we now have. Thank you, Wilfried. Rebecca. You need to unmute yourself. Rebecca Harms, where are we? We can't. Unmuted. Yes. Oh, <laughs> yeah, uh, good morning to everybody and thanks uh, for the invitation. Um, I would like to add to what Marie Louise said and to what also David Stulik said that um, there are certain issues uh, which will not uh, open uh, international doors uh, for a good crisis solution. Uh, so don't make this a crisis caused by mainly Russians. It's um, something which will not convince nobody who knows the scene in Ukraine. It's a crisis with many roots and uh, so responsible uh, for uh, the uh, way we went uh, into this in Ukraine, responsible are many different uh, political actors uh, and also actors in uh, business who always have been ready to change uh, camps if it serves their interest. Um, I think uh, the EU will not be convinced about a solution uh, which is only carried by one political uh, force or a narrow majority uh, or the, ne right, the necessary majority. I think what Marie-Louise started to explain is uh, we want to see something, yeah, as also Friends of Ukraine, uh, which has a stronger support uh, among the political elites uh, and uh, therefore also in the country. Stability will not be gained uh, by confrontation. And uh, Daria, you know Brussels, uh, so um, there were many meetings during the last years um, and we always called it urgency and crisis meetings. Uh, we always discussed as if we would be close uh, to the end of a democratic process. Uh, I think we are still um, in the midst of a long lasting uh, process. Um, and I think there should be enough time to find um, a better backed uh, solution. Um, so EU, whilst in the battle for rule of law in many countries uh, outside of the EU in Eastern neighborhood and even inside of the EU, cannot now go to Kiev and say, okay, we have a fast, uh, a bit dirty solution, uh, but we will take it uh, to win the fight against corruption. Um, I'm still convinced that to win the fight against corruption, uh, much more is needed than we have done so far. And maybe uh, the deep uh, reform of the judiciary and not only uh, the a new form of the constitutional court should be part of the agreements to be discussed. All right, thank you so much, Rebecca, for this uh, comment as well. Uh, we have to wrap it up. I promise the speakers this will be 60 to 65 minutes. So, but I want to give um, Roman, Ira, and David the last opportunity to wrap it up. So please, uh, maybe Roman, um, some of your final thoughts, if, if you want to, to what you heard, uh, what are the messages that we should take away from this discussion, Pan Roman? Ну, я приблизно розумів, як наші європейські друзі розуміють ситуацію, тому що ми, ну, мені дуже приємно, насправді, що ми з вами, в принципі, однодумці, та, що ми переживаємо з вами ці речі разом. Е, ну, ви мусите розуміти, що в нас так само є там, невелика, але є частина населення, яка проросійська, так, і вони вибирають собі проросійські партії. Е, але ми з цим працюємо. Я залишаюся оптимістом, Я думаю, що все буде гаразд, якщо ви нам будете, ну, в тому числі допомагати діалогом і впливом на нашу владу, в тому числі, що ви маєте, ну, доступ розмовляти з нею і з нами в тому числі. Дякую вам. Thank you precise and optimistic upbeat mood. Uh, um, David, please. <laughs> we are now having a kind of extensive exchange of views with uh, Dasha. 
I do perfectly understand all these concerns that my kind of long lasting friends like her, like her colleagues from Antac, uh, have right now. I do share them. Uh, on the other hand, I see also the perils and the risks uh, of uh, finding shortcuts. Uh, I'm also, I'm not so optimistic at this moment that the situation could be ruled out in a kind of a, a positive, elegant way. I think that, uh, as one of the Ukrainian politicians, Oleg Kubachev, used to say, Ukraine might miss another occasion to miss the occasion. Unfortunately, this can happen right now. But what is more important, democracy is not about, like, say, one spin of effects. Uh, you have to explain these things to the people, to your compatriots. And I don't think that Ukrainians are, in general, are so naive that they would not understand who is right and who is wrong in, in, the, in this uh, current constitutional crisis. So I believe that uh, the next elections, or maybe the elections after the next ones, will bring us closer to the more optimal solution of these uh, issues, challenges that you are now having with the rule of law. And these are the things that uh, haven't been solved uh, since the very uh, beginning of the independent Ukraine. These things were some sort of, a, how do you call this, these skeletons in the board. Now they have uh, caught you. The, then now they are there, you have to face them. And any solution that you have is not the ideal one. But still, we are not working on a short-term track. We are working on mid-term and long-term solutions. And here I'm optimistic. And uh, I can promise you, as one of those friends of Ukraine, that we will do our best here within the EU to support you in that. Yeah, that we can promise you too. And of course, David, you, you sense that you've, uh, one senses that you've been long, uh, for a long time in Ukraine, you have a nearly endless uh, uh, patience. Uh, Ira, maybe your closing uh, thoughts on this discussion. Yeah, thank you, Mattia. I do believe that this crisis is much bigger than many other crises, many, many, many other crises that we had uh, from 2014. And why it's so? Because always we would need to fight just for one, maybe two reforms at the same time. And here we're fighting with the Constitutional Court that is fighting with all reforms at the same moment. So it's not about just anti-corruption, land, everything. it's about all of them all about the laws that the Constitutional Court can cancel. And because the more we wait to find a perfect, ideal, elegant solution, the more reforms we are losing. They already published, as Daria said, the, the draft law on the land reform, and every day they, they can consider other and other legislation. This doesn't mean that we need to stop looking for that solution. We need to buy us some time, and to do that, the, to my opinion, to my personal opinion, is the best thing that we could do from all of the not perfect decision that is there is to increase the number for adopting a uh, number of votes for adopting the constitutional court decision till 15. We have 18 judges in the uh, seats in the constitutional court now we have 15 judges so until the new more trustworthy judges are elected, they all would need to come to a consensus to adopt any decision. And still will help us to have at least some institutional constitutional court if we have obviously unconstitutional, unlawful decisions, for example, concerning the, uh, the status of the areas that are not under control of Ukraine. So we would still have an institution that could block this law. And this would win us time to look for a more strategic, more longer, more sustainable solutions from this crisis and from, from this situation. Thank you. All right, unless Daria, you have to intervene here. Um, I'll wrap it up. Um, I will not try to even summarize it. Um, I just uh, wanna say that hopefully the, even the less elegant, um, um, more constructive, less damaging solutions will pass because there's some even in Ukraine and we will not discuss it any further, let's say that the Constitutional Court can block any changes. So let's um, see and continue this. So uh, we will be watching very closely how the NABU situation continues mm -hmm. because obviously, uh, David Stulik, thank you for mentioning that earlier, by mid-December, uh, the investigative agency NABU will face basically constitutional another crisis. Mm -hmm. um, so if that problem is not solved, we will see new ones. And let's follow the developments closely and we will reconvene sessions on the developments um, again if the situation requires. So thank you again, 
uh, for Ira, for Roman, um, Dasha, David for uh, coming and agreeing to speak on such a short notice in these difficult times. And we will uh, do our best to support you uh, in Ukraine from, from, from Berlin. So, Tuzhe Diakvio and um, um, Thank you.